20 member states throughout Europe, a geographical expansion underway, an international collaboration throughout the world, and a scientific challenge on a scale second to none. With a complexity of this size, how is CERN managed? This is the remit of the CERN Council, which, among other things, defines the strategic programs, approves the annual objectives, the budget, and nominates the directorate. I am very pleased to welcome today Professor Michel Spirou, Scientific Director of the CNRS, but also, since January 2010, President of the CERN Council. Hello and welcome, Professor. Hello. I'm also delighted to be joined by my colleagues Stéphane and François. Hello, Hello to Anna. you both. Hello. It's going to be a question of antimatter today, the press, but we're also going to talk about water and towers. I'll say no more. Welcome to Spotlight on CERN. <laughs> So, Professor, in my introduction I referred to geographical expansion. Can you tell us where CERN is at with this uh, expansion to new countries? Yes, with pleasure. So, you can see on the map uh, which is shown here, uh, in white you have uh, the countries which so far have no connection with CERN yet. In red you see the countries which participate only to experiments at CERN, through cooperation agreements. In green, you see the countries which, uh, contribute, which participated to experiments at CERN, but which contributed also to the construction of the LHC uh, machine. And for that, they are invited to some council uh, sessions as observers. And in blue, you have the heart of CERN, these uh, European countries, which all uh, sit for every session of Council, which decide the budget, the uh, objectives, and which uh, finally are uh, managing CERN. So far, these uh, blue countries were only European, and CERN was a birth, a kind of a cradle of uh, the birth of, of, of Europe. But now, uh, by the end of uh, 2010, the Council has decided that any country in the world, in principle, could become a member of, of CERN. And uh, there are already five applicants, five new applicants, uh, Slovenia, Cyprus, Serbia, Israel and Turkey, which would like to become soon member of CERN. So this shows that uh, we have already an enlarged mm -hmm. Europe. But there are also a very strong sign now from Brazil, from Ukraine, and even from uh, India, that they would like to become associate to CERN, which could be the first step before they become uh, full members. So all this shows that uh, CERN is becoming a, a global uh, organization with a common scientific endeavor. So this common scientific endeavor, what is it exactly that brings all these countries together? Yeah, it's rather surprising that uh, what you see on this map, so you have countries of different uh, culture, of different regions, of different uh, politics, political systems that are very often opposed uh, against each, each other and uh, which collaborate for this uh, common goal. And this common goal is to try to share a, a common representation of uh, nature and of matter and uh, to share a common history of, uh, of the universe, our common, common history. history. Uh, so, uh, for this uh, collaborative effort, uh, it is not surprising that CERN has been the place where many uh, new uh, collaborative tools uh, were uh, invented. The most uh, famous and emblematic is, uh, is the web, which is now used by everywhere, even by Spotlight and CERN. Uh, but there are also new tools which are coming on, like uh, the grid, which is a kind of a, net, a global network of uh, computers, where everywhere on the planet uh, you can access to the data and analyze the data on equal footing. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, CERN is also developing uh, uh, a way that uh, all papers based on uh, LHC results will be uh, freely accessible everywhere in all universities through the world. So you see, it's really a common scientific. Common idea. scientific goals indeed. Thank you very much. I turn to you, Stefan, now, so better not have vertigo for today's visit. Uh, take your binoculars and follow me. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Today, I bring you to the highest point of CERN. Built in 1970, 56 meters above the ground level, the water tower. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 358 steps later, we are almost at the top of the water tower. The water tower with a tank of 750 cubic meters. And now, top of the top. Wow, what a lovely day. At my feet, 10,000 people work for particle physics. Let's have a closer look. I can see the globe of science and innovation. I can see Atlas. I can see the computing center, Linac 4. Over here, yes, over here is the SM18, the place where all the magnets of the LHC were tested. And far away, across the border, I can see the Prevsin site with the CCC, the CERN Control Center. I love to spend the day here, but I may be late for the press review. See you soon. So welcoming Stéphane back now from the water tower. Do you still have enough energy left to give us the press review? Yes, it was nice. Ah, so some press cuttings from the press around the world, and I'd like to thank the press office for their help. Uh, we start with uh, many, many newspapers like El País or The Economist, who widely commented the death of Simon Vandermeer on the 4th of March. Laureate of uh, Physics Nobel Prize in 1984 with the Carlo Rubia, Simon Vandermeer joined CERN in 1956 and was a star of the laboratory. His contribution to accelerators technology remains crucial for the LHC. On the 8th of March, we celebrated the International Women's Day number 100. For this occasion, the Guardian established a list of 100 women of the world who were considered as most inspirational. Among them is Fabiola Gianotti, who is the spokesperson of ATLAS. She has the responsibility of 3,000 people coming from about 200 physics institutions on the five continents. Greetings and congratulations. Times of India now, who uh, tells us about the computing Big Bang in Kolkata, formerly Calcutta. The city should welcome soon one node of the worldwide computing grid and so will participate in the analysis of the data produced by the LHC. I remind you that this will represent a stack of CD-ROMs of 20 kilometers of height. And to conclude, let's stay in India with the daily paper The Hindu which relays the information indicating that India may soon become an associated member of CERN, tightening the bounds between CERN and the scientific world. The family is growing and the horizon is widening. Indeed. Thank you very much, Stefan. Pleasure. So, Professor, following this press review, what do the words communication and education mean to you? Outreach and education are really crucial for, the, uh, for a sustainable development of particle physics and cosmology. So CERN is very active on, uh, on the two fronts. For outreach, uh, two examples. Uh, CERN is organizing about uh, 60,000 visits per year. So it's a huge uh, log logistics. Uh, also, uh, Spotlight on CERN is a, a second initiative, which is uh, remarkable. And there are many other initiatives. For uh, education, uh, I will quote again two examples. Uh, CERN has a special program for uh, teachers. So CERN welcomes teachers from many countries and gives them uh, uh, lessons in their own languages so that they can come back and teach their uh, students, their children, uh, in order to, to teach science and particle physics. Second, uh, CERN is part also of an effort which was uh, stimulated by uh, Georges Charpak, uh, the famous uh, Nobel Prize uh, physicist at CERN uh, who, who died recently, uh, which is called the hands-on science, which allow uh, children to access science through concrete experiments. It's a way to broaden a little bit uh, the spectrum of competence of, uh, of uh, gifts uh, that the children may have. For science. Uh, very good initiatives indeed. Thank you very much. And in the spirit of education, you've prepared something about antimatter today. Yes, uh, today we'll try to answer this question. Is it uh, advice to shake hands with a person made of antimatter? And we'll try to answer that in less than one minute. Let's take a look. <laughs> A person made of antimatter, if it existed, would be made of antiatoms and antiparticles. But what is antimatter? 
For each particle discovered so far by physicists, there is an antiparticle. It's like a mirror particle having the same mass but the opposite electric charge, a bit like your image in a mirror. Matter is made of particles, antimatter is made of antiparticles. When a particle meets its antiparticle, they annihilate and they liberate a vast amount of energy. If one gram of matter would meet one gram of antimatter, they would generate more than 20,000 megawatt hours of energy. So I really do not recommend you to shake the hands of a person made of antimatter. That would be too dangerous. At CERN we produce antimatter daily, but don't worry. At the rate we produce it, it would take us more than 1 billion years to create one gram of antimatter. So Francois, it looks like coming into contact with antimatter is not recommended. Yes, but the risk we meet a person made of antimatter, such a quantity, is non-existent. Uh, in fact, at CERN we create antimatter by colliding two standard matter particles, and with the energy of the collision, this energy is transformed into new particles and antiparticles, but very, very few each time. It's the same principle which happened during the Big Bang. It was a vast amount of energy which transformed into particles and antiparticles in equal amount. But nowadays, when we look around us, we see in the universe only matter, normal matter. So it seems that the antimatter, the primordial antimatter, has disappeared. We don't see it. So we can see no trace of antimatter anyway. In fact, we can see some traces of antimatter particles coming to Earth, apparently from space. But we think that they might be the result of a collision of a matter particle from space which hit a matter particle of our atmosphere. So to make sure we see primordial antimatter from outer space, we need to put our detector above the atmosphere in space. Mm -hmm. And that's what is going to happen uh, end of April, when the AMS experiment will be lifted up with uh, the last Endeavour tr um, Space shuttle, sp yes. uh, Space shuttle, sorry. Right. The last Endeavour space shuttle will take the AMS experiment up to the International Space Station and will attach it there and will, it will work for many years and try to detect traces of primordial yes. uh, antimatter. Is CERN part of this AMS experiment? Yes, in fact, the, the AMS detector is a detector a bit like the ones we are using at CERN and CERN has par participated to this project. Uh, the detector has been assembled at CERN and also CERN is going to provide the control center to control the data uh, flow coming from the experiment. Mm -hmm. What is very exceptional is the size of AMS. It's 64 cubic meters, so imagine they will have to manipulate that in space. And uh, so next time you'll see the shuttle uh, going up, uh, you'll remember that it's a half, a eight and a half tons of equipment assembled at CERN, which goes there. Eight and a half tons of equipment. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Francois. Professor Spiro, would you have a few words to uh, close this spotlight for us? Thank you. Uh, in the beginning of this year, so we are being prepared for this launch of AMS, but we have also the restart of LHE, which is a big event. And we are looking forward to two very exciting years of uh, LHE running, data collecting, and uh, hopefully making discoveries. And we are planning by the end of uh, 2012, after these two years of running, to have a special session of, of the Sun Council, which will be uh, at the ministerial level, we hope, close adjacent to the uh, competitiveness uh, meeting of ministers in Brussels, so that uh, we could uh, use this meeting, based on the results of LHG, to develop a vision for particle physics. And second, uh, which I think uh, as important, to, uh, we, we have agreed with OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic and, uh, and Cooperation Development, mm -hmm. that OECD will use CERN and LHC as a test bed to measure the uh, societal, so social impact and the be uh, economic benefit of, uh, of CERN and LHC. So they will report mm -hmm. at uh, this meeting uh, on this uh, analysis, and this could be communicated to the comp competitiveness uh, uh, meeting of ministers and also maybe to the G20. And finally, we would like to have uh, many outreach events, and I am sure that the Spotlight on CERN will be part of them. Uh, we hope so too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Francois and uh, Stéphane, and see you soon for another edition of Spotlight on CERN. <laughs>